This meeting is being recorded. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. I think we're just gonna give a few more seconds to let more individuals join this uh, webinar. All right, um, so hi everyone, my name is Alice Salon. I wanna thank you all for joining today's member webinar, which is titled Utility of Genetics in Pediatric Solid Organ Transplant Evaluation. So just some general housekeeping before we start. So we do encourage questions to be asked throughout the presentation. As a courtesy to our presenters, all attendees have been muted. Please utilize the Zoom Q&A for questions you may have throughout the presentation. The chat function is also available for discussion throughout the talk. Questions will be read aloud during the last 10 minutes of the webinar. So for today, today's learning objectives are to review the current use of genetics within transplant programs, to discuss the utility of genetics in the transplant evaluation process, and to highlight bioethical issues regarding the use of genomics in transplant programs. Today, we're joined by our two lovely speakers. Um, our first is Nicole Choi. Nicole Choi is a board certified genetic counselor and licensed in the state of California. They received their master's degree from the Keck Graduate Institute and is currently a genetic counselor at Kaiser Permanente, where their practice focuses on inborn errors of metabolism. Our second is Amber Hildreth. Dr. Hildreth is an assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Diego, and associate medical director for hepatology and transplant at Rady Children's Hospital, San Diego. She is also a, clinical sci a clinician scientist at the Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine, where her research focuses on rapid diagnosis of pediatric patients with liver disease. At this time, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Dr. Hildreth, who is our first speaker. Hi, thank you. So I will go ahead and get started. Um, just as an overview of our talk today, we'll review some current policies um, in regards to solid organ transplant and um, use of genetics. We'll go through a review of the literature. I'll be focusing on the liver as I'm a transplant hepatologist. And then we'll pass it over to Nicole who will be going through kidney, heart, reviewing transplant programs. And then I think a big topic and of major interest is of ethical considerations regarding genetics um, in transplant evaluations. So, if we look initially at what policies currently exist in 
uh, the use of genetics and uh, diagnostics in solid organ transplant evaluation, the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, or the OPTN, which is really our governing body where that houses the policies and procedures over transplant programs and organ procurement organizations. And there are some set guidelines based on certain diseases to where genetics need to be confirmed um, or in some cases biochemical testing. And then some examples, you know, particularly in the pediatric world come from having that genetic diagnosis to be able to get accurate points when we're listing patients. So when we're listing patients for liver transplant, we use MELD and PELD scores. MELD is the model for end-stage liver disease. PELD is the pediatric end-stage liver disease, and that's used for children less than 12. Um, and there are, with certain genetic disorders, we can actually get more points for having that diagnosis. And um, so here's just some examples here. It's also important um, as we're just looking at in general transplant for genetic disorders, um, a big topic that I'll talk about is inborn errors in metabolism. And those patients actually get a higher priority over any, over patients that have just what we call a calculated PELD score. Um, we also know that um, there are some policies in place when it comes to uh, living donation, and I think this is an area that's definitely going to be changing as we start to integrate more um, next generation sequencing technologies into transplant evaluations. But currently, um, it is mandated that uh, people that are being evaluated for living um, donation, so that would be someone giving a kidney or someone giving a piece of their liver, uh, it's required to have in the consent process that there is an inherent risk of a living donor um, having a discovery of a genetic disease in their evaluation process. Um, and then in, in general, there are, you know, it's not very specific standards right now, but it is listed that um, for evaluation for um, living kidney and liver donors need to have obviously an evaluation for personal history um, of genetic kidney disease, and that each center has to have their own protocol on how they evaluate for genetic liver disease. But again, there's not really a mandated standard yet there. And when we look at, you know, how in general genetic testing is used, it's, it's definitely variable um, and it's not as prevalent as we would think. So uh, Madeline Graf and colleagues provided a survey uh, to 163 pediatric liver, heart, and kidney transplant centers assessing how they utilize genetic testing. And so 64% say that if there is a clinical indication, they would do genetic testing prior to listing a patient for transplant only 16% will do genetic testing regardless of clinical indication. So I think where this is you know, going to become a change is now that we have more access to whole exome and whole genome sequencing, doing more expensive genetic testing, I think we'll start to see this utilized more, but a big area is going to be education to the transplant centers on how to utilize this technology and also support from genetic counselors and medical geneticists helping these providers that may not have as much experience with genetic testing results deciding how to utilize that in the transplant listing process. Uh, and then they also evaluated the impact of genetic risk on listing considerations. Um, and this is something that we'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. So as a hepatologist now, I'll move into talking about uh, genetic causes of pediatric liver disease and how I look at uh, genetic testing for evaluating and listening for liver transplant. So just as an example, here's a list of um, causes of genetic liver disease in patients that may require liver transplant. So I look at it as categories of our cholestatic liver disorders. So Allagil syndrome and progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis as examples. We can definitely see liver involvement in a variety of mitochondrial disorders. 
uh, cystic fibrosis can cause liver disease. And now that these patients are living longer, uh, we're actually seeing patients that are need, more and more needing liver transplants in their early adulthood. Uh, chromosomal disorders can cause a variety of liver disorders. Endocrinopathies can definitely affect the liver. And then a topic that I'll go into more detail about today is inborn errors of metabolism. So I'm not going to read through everything here, but just to give you an idea that there is a pretty long list of inborn errors of metabolism that have hepatic manifestations. Now, some of these disorders we would provide a liver transplant for, other disorders would, be, would not require liver transplant either because it's a multi-system disease. So giving a new liver is not going to necessarily help their whole body or could be really a contraindication um, against doing a liver transplant if it's something that may make the patient even sicker. When I think about liver transplant and our inborn errors, we really are looking at two different categories. And so there are the disorders where we feel it's considered a cure if we do a liver transplant. And examples, you know, I have listed here, these are disorders that can be, that we do consider a full cure when they have a liver transplant. Now, there's usually some organ systems as I listed here that we'll still monitor after, but the thought is it's more monitoring for injury that happened prior to transplant that may become more chronic. We don't necessarily expect to have issues with worsening, particularly CNS involvement down the line. Um, and in this list, there's, you know, again, two different categories. There's the disorders that actually cause liver disease. So alpha and nitrypsin deficiency, for example, is the most common um, uh, inborn error that we diagnose in liver disease. And that, because of the misfolded protein, gets stuck in the hepatocytes. That leads to fibrosis and cirrhosis and ultimately end-stage liver disease, and those patients require liver transplant. Now, on the other end, we can look at urea cycle defects, such as OTC deficiency, where there's no uh, true liver disease. These patients don't have cirrhosis, but by doing the transplant, we're, re we're replacing that enzyme defect and repairing the urea cycle, so then we do not have truly that disorder present in the body anymore. And then there's disorders that it's definitely not a cure, but there's been enough evidence to support it is increases, you know, the quality of life and is this risk of having the liver transplant is acceptable in decreasing the overall morbidity and mortality that the patient would otherwise have from their inborn error. And so I think, you know, an example with the organic acidemias, for example, and I had a patient that we did a combined liver kidney transplant on, that part went well, but she still had a metabolic stroke within about a month after transplant. Fortunately, she recovered from that, but again, it's important for us to know that with some of these disorders, it does not completely take away the risk. Now, a very interesting topic is how adult transplant centers may deal with uh, patients with inborn errors in metabolism. Obviously in pediatrics, this is something we're much more familiar with and much more comfortable with, but because there are a few different approaches from the metabolic docs, some are very early to refer to transplant, some really try to manage as much as they can medically before even discussing transplant as an option. There are some patients that will make it into adulthood and may just start to have more decompensation or decide that they wanna pursue um, a liver transplant. But in the adult world, the, the, the knowledge isn't as much there just because it's less prevalent. So um, this was a survey that was given out to um, adult transplant, uh, liver transplant hospitals, look as trying to assess you know, the team's comfort and knowledge about liver transplant in these patients. And some of the biggest barriers that were brought up was that the transplant team is not comfortable with the underlying disease. There's concern that the cognitive impairment in the patient may lead to noncompliance with medications post-transplant. And of course, in that case, there's you know, high risk of rejection of the organ and death. That because of the multi-system nature of the disease, that may 
make a single organ transplant inappropriate, or that because the argument of, well, is there really enough risk of life-threatening decompensation to warrant doing a liver transplant? So I think this is a, a big area for more education as there are definitely, you know, not going to be any less adults potentially making it um, into adulthood and having to have assessment for liver transplant. So how I use genetics in my evaluation for liver transplant. So first, uh, you know, we're looking at, I'd say one category is in patients with acute liver failure. So uh, in general, about 20 and even outside of liver failure, about 20% of all pediatric liver transplants occur in patients with a monogenetic disease. Um, and of course, this information is helpful. You know, we want to be able to make a genetic diagnosis in those that aren't in liver failure. We have more time. Those who are in liver failure, I'll talk about a little bit later. This is where really the rapid testing has become super important. Um, but it's important to have that diagnosis as we're going into transplant because it's going to help us look at if there's any other organs or any special considerations that we need to think about, if there's any you know, changes in how we're managing those patients, whether it's their nutrition or other supplements they need, they need leading it up to transplant and looking at their eligibility and particularly looking at how we can list them and how we can get them exception points if needed, which gives them a higher priority as they're waiting for a liver um, and an area where I think we're going to start to use this more is in evaluation of living donors, making sure that there's not a genetic disorder there that may be a problem to then take a piece of that liver and give it to a child that may end up having a new disease later in life. And so, you know, one of the this is starting to become more and more prevalent in working towards how we can best use genetic testing in transplant and really with the increase in the amount of next generation sequencing is it really reframing how we're approaching this and I think largely that I'll talk about in a little bit is the time to diagnosis in these sicker kids but it has been something that's being been looked at for the past few years and it really started with development of panel testing so trying to look at the highest yield diet you know potential diagnoses and put them into one panel to hopefully help expedite and target our um, assessment and evaluation of these patients. And where this information comes into play is again, to making decisions about listing patients and particularly you know, having a diagnosis in patients with acute decompensation, as well as giving us that information for long-term care. So where I think we're really moving to is with more of the rapid testing in the sickest patient populations, which would be acute liver failure. So in the Pediatric Acute Liver Failure Study Group, their first publication that came out a few years ago, I uh, had 348 children with acute liver failure. And within this group, 10% had, um, were diagnosed with a metabolic disease. However, there were still 49% of patients that were indeterminate. Now, rapid whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing was not used in this study. So we really suspect that we're, you know, still with about half the patients not having a diagnosis. We suspect that there's absolutely going to be some genetic and metabolic etiologies there. So as we can start to utilize more rapid testing, that's definitely going to improve our evaluation of these sicker patients. And it, again, it's really important to have that diagnosis to help inform our transplant decisions because it can provide confidence to the team about listing a patient. However, I think almost more importantly, it can tell us if we have a diagnosis that would be either an absolute or a relative contraindication for transplant. So in our mitochondrial depletion syndromes, you know, metabolic or uh, mitochondrial disorders, there's a lot of debate on, you know, if it's, if it's, the right move in some of these cases to transplant, and some we're learning are a definite contraindications to transplant, as it's not going to ultimately save the patient. Uh, and then it's important to have this information, again, in the, the liver failure patients for operative considerations, if there's any specific glucose management or different things that we need to take into account. And lastly, so this is hot off the press, um, a publication that we just got accepted to liver transplantation last month 
where um, it's just three cases that we had uh, that were all neonates presenting in liver failure. And for these patients, they all underwent ultra rapid whole genome sequencing with a turnaround time of 48 to 72 hours. We had three diagnoses, so PRF1, which causes familial HLH, FDXR, which is newly being investigated um, as, and hopefully relabeled soon as a kind of a mitochondriopathy, and then ASL or arginosesinate lyase deficiency. What was really important about this case was, you know, all of the, you know, babies that present in liver failure can really all look the same. And so as hepatologists, as we're looking, we're saying, you know, should we list this patient for transplant or do they have something that is, we should not be transplanting for? So in this case, the HLH case, for example, it's considered, you know, this used to be a disorder that patients underwent liver transplant for more frequently, but the outcomes are really poor and the patient and graft survival is only about in 60%. So most people are not doing liver transplants for HLH. And obviously a lot of these patients, if they're able to be clinically stabilized, end up getting a bone marrow transplant. FDXR, so again, this patient was really presented as classic liver failure. And it's really hard you know, to distinguish a mitochondriopathy from other causes. But, and so it's, you know, unfortunately this patient also um, passed away, but it's very, understandable that if this patient would have lived a little bit longer, they could have been evaluated and provided a liver transplant. And ultimately for this patient, that would have not fixed them. Um, you know, and another reason we think about that is not only for that patient, but there's an organ shortage. We don't have enough organs to go around. So if we're going to be doing a transplant on someone that ultimately doesn't need it, whether because they're unfortunately going to die anyway, or if there's another treatment, that organ can go to someone else who's waiting for it. And then ASL, this is an indication for liver transplant. So this patient had their diagnosis and after in, um, I believe around nine months of age, they ended up getting a liver transplant. And then the last piece of this, and this is a busy slide, but you know, one of the things that we're working on trying to show is, you know, of course, I think a lot of us can say, let's send ultra rapid genome sequence everyone. Well, it's expensive and we don't have the accessibility to do that everywhere now. So Part of what we're trying to show is why this should be a first line test. It's, you know, minimal blood volume. It can cover an expansive amount of our differential diagnosis versus sending off all these different serologic tests, getting bone marrow biopsies, getting liver biopsies, waiting, you know, panel testing takes a couple of weeks. So hopefully as we're moving forward, we're going to be able to start to implement more of these rapid technologies and have them more available to everyone and then again, have the support to the transplant teams to understand what to do with this information. So I will now be switching over. Pass it awesome. So thank you so much, Dr. Hildreth, uh, for that wonderful, wonderful kind of recap of the utility of genetics in liver transplant. So I will be honest, I'm, I'm not as much of an expert in my organ systems as she is, um, but I will be going over very, very briefly um, kind of solid organs for kidney and heart transplant, which were two of the other systems that we looked at in our review of literature. Um, so this slide is meant to just serve as some some of the genetic causes that may require kidney transplant um, in the pediatric setting, not so much autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, but definitely autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease may be something that um, we would consider transplant for, Alport syndrome, uh, Fabry disease, which while an X-linked disorder, we you know can affect both men and women. Um, Familial focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, or FSGS, which is a bit of a special case, and I'll kind of talk about that really briefly in one of my next slides, as well as atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is by no means a comprehensive list, but it's just meant to kind of illustrate some of the conditions that we may be thinking of when we think about genetic causes behind uh, kidney disease or kidney failure. Um, so um, in review of the literature, what we found that is that Living donors for, for PKD in particular is kind of what we found the most evidence for, but about 40% of people who are donating are related to their recipients, so um, referred to as living kidney donors. So that's a pretty large population of people that if the person receiving the transplant 
has a genetic cause behind their kidney failure um, could potentially also be at risk um, and really highlights the need for the utility or use of genetics in evaluating those donors and whether or not they are they're going to be good donors for, for our patient or if they may need surveillance and management themselves for potential um, effects to their own health. Um, we also found that um, genetic testing in the setting of evaluating transplant candidacy um, is really helpful because it's I mean, the main goal to be identifying a genetic etiology for end-stage renal disease um, is a huge role for genetic testing. It can also allow for preemptive screening for extra renal manifestations. It may even qualify for changes in clinical care. Um, the best example that I, I can come up with is for FSGS. Um, in my research, I found that FSGS FSGS often recurs in about 14 to 60% of individuals who do undergo transplant, in which case that situation would be definitely a consideration um, as part of pre-transplant counseling and maybe, you know, it may play a role in whether or not that transplant team feels comfortable um, recommending transplant in the situation or in the circumstance of FSGS. Um, it can also highlight areas where there may be other treatments available depending on the genetic etiology that they are able to identify. Um, and it can also highlight some post-transplant complications. So FSGS is another good example, but if there are extra renal manifestations, are there other organ systems that we need to be watching? Um, and is there any other aspects of the disease that could be affecting other body systems that have not yet been screened for? Um, and then obviously kind of going back is, cascade testing for, for at-risk family members. Is there, are there other family members, siblings, parents that could potentially also be at risk um, for other complications? And in my research, I found this organization called the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes or KDGO. Um, KDGO is a global organization that's dedicated to developing and implementing evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for the treatment and management of kidney disease. Um, and some of their guidelines explicitly state that donor candidates um, that are found to have genetic kidney disease and that can cause kidney failure should not donate. Um, and it also warns that current online assessment tools used to evaluate genetic or familial risk um, do not always capture effectively their risk um, that should be considered as part of their donor eligibility. Um, it also refers that for transplant candidates, they have guidelines that came out very recently in 2020 um, that encourage genetic evaluation prior to transplant, just because that can provide uh, better recurrence risks and guidance for treatment and management for the patient and family. Um, they also highlighted that genetic testing and finding an etiology can provide a lot of psychosocial benefits for patients and families um, that can have long-term impacts even, you know, after the diagnosis of the end-stage renal disease, um, as I'm sure we're all aware. Something that I thought was really interesting and kind of current is that these guidelines specifically discuss the use of whole exome sequencing. In particular, they talk about the ACMG list of 59 genes um, and how that may impact post-transplant care and follow-up. And later on, I'll kind of talk a little bit about how those genes may um, also play a role in contraindications for transplant depending on the transplant facility. Um, so those are just something to consider. I think more of this KDGO kind of brings it up as something for uh, transplant facilities to, to consider when counseling patients for pre-transplant um, eligibility. And it also is meant to guide institutional policies on the use of genetic testing in determining genetic etiologies for, for kidney disease. Um, I want to highlight a few articles that along the way I thought were really impactful. Um, this article by Thomas and colleagues, um, they had created a panel of genes, about 115 genes, all related to different forms of genetic kidney disease that was intended to screen living kidney donors. Um, their sample size was pretty small. Um, I think they only screened about six donors that were related to recipients. Um, but of the candidates, they found a genetic diagnosis in three out of four of the transplant candidates, which gave them a genetic diagnosis. Um, and they also were able to eliminate some of the living kidney donors that carried the same mutations. And um, I think the, the real takeaways from this study is that it, it highlights the utility of, of genetic testing. Um, 
in the evaluation of both transplant candidates and living kidney donors. It also helped to rule out pre-symptomatic donors um, that basically gave them the, the green light to go ahead and move forward with kidney transplant, which I think is, is huge in many different ways. Um, this article also described the potential of expanding the living donor pool by, by essentially being able to rule out um, genetic causes for kidney disease. This article in particular, I think it came out in 2017, um, but it talked about the use of whole exome. Um, and at the time it talked about high cost, depth of coverage, time to results. And we know that a lot of that has changed in recent years um, with exomes becoming more affordable, still expensive, but more affordable. Um, and the turnaround time for exomes and even rapid whole genomes um, is something that we're learning is becoming less and less of a barrier over time. And so I think the discussion of of implementing whole exome and all of the messiness that can come with the USAs, incidental findings, um, and all of that is definitely something that we should all be considering as we move forward in this field and, and discussions of, of pretest counseling um, in both the transplant setting and, and outside of it. Um, and um, finally, this article, I kind of emphasized the ability to provide more clinical certainty in being able to you know, really come to a genetic diagnosis for, for those transplant candidates. So kind of continuing on in that discussion of whole exome sequencing, I found a couple of articles that I thought were really notable to mention, um, starting with the one on the bottom right um, by Nan et al. This was a case report that um, looked at underlying genetic disorders that precluded or predicted post-transplant complications in pediatric transplant recipients. Um, this study had a diagnostic yield of 32.7%, which I thought was fairly impressive. Um, and I think what's important is that this article and the Groupman article kind of talk about those incidental findings and what impact that might have on patients. In the Groupman article in the top right, this is, um, this is an article with a much larger cohort, over 3,000 different patients, both adult and pediatric. Um, they actually found that 34 of their patients in their cohort actually had pathogenic variants in at least one of the ACMG59 genes, um, which they, you know, they concluded impacted the management of their renal phenotypes, at least. Um, and this, the results for both of these studies impacted the clinical care of the patients. But um, something that I think is, is really important to consider is that those incidental findings um, mentioned you know, in that graph at all article that we talked about at the very beginning of our talk, um, could potentially serve as contraindications or reconsiderations on whether or not to list an individual for transplant, um, especially when we think about things like cancer predisposition genes that may increase an individual's risk for cancer and how an institution may use that um, as, a, as a rationale as to why someone may not be a good candidate for transfer that, that can reap um, I think the phrase is the most benefit. Um, I think the other thing that was really highlighted in, in both of these articles is um, that I think is more the takeaway for, for me at least is that they were able to find a genetic diagnosis which has a huge impact obviously for clinical care but definitely recurrence risks, at-risk family members, things like that. Moving on to the heart, um, this is just another brief summary slide of, of some conditions in which heart transplant may be indicated, 22Q, otherwise known as DeGeorge, um, or velocardiofacial syndrome. Noonan syndrome, trisomies, um, 18, 13, 21, mitochondrial disorders, as well as some neuromuscular disorders like DMD, BMD. So really the utility in heart transplant, I think echoes everything that we've talked about for the kidney and the liver. Um, it's really helpful in determining transplant eligibility um, for patients being able to identify a, a genetic diagnosis that could potentially highlight some surgical complications. Um, in the presence of extra cardiac findings, I think the best example of this is Noonan syndrome. Um, new, individuals with Noonan syndrome or other rasopathies may be at risk for um, coagulation defects, and that's definitely something that, that everyone is evaluated for um, prior to any sort of major surgery, but could definitely impact a, an institution's decision to move forward with transplant. Um, an article by McCallan et al. Um, that I had read as part of this review of literature also highlighted the increased risk for cancer. And that article actually talked about 
the increased risk of cancer potentially being a contraindication for transplant. Um, not that I necessarily agree with that, but um, I think that's important to know what, what our colleagues and peers are considering when making these decisions of whether or not to list a child for, for a potentially life-saving transplant. Um, the McCallan et al. article did go on to say that they did not find any evidence that transplant was any less successful in Noonan syndrome patients than compared to patients without a genetic diagnosis of Noonan syndrome. Um, but I do think that's something to, to mention. Um, other contraindications in the settings of extra cardiac findings are things like mitochondrial disease, which I feel like Dr. Hildreth really explained well in the setting of liver transplant. But as we know, mitochondrial diseases affect many organ systems systemically. And so that's definitely something to consider about whether or not a heart transplant is, is going to be most beneficial for this patient, given, given all of the other findings and, and symptoms that can happen with with that disease. Um, neuromuscular disorders, um, as well as developmental delay have also been mentioned in a few of the articles that I read as, as contraindications for transplant, just given the systemic effects of the disease. Developmental delay is something that I wanna talk about in more detail, and I will do that in, in the next slide. Um, but again, um, reproductive risks, I think that's huge for not only family members, but our patients ourselves. Um, you know, with modern medicine, a lot, we, we're seeing that a lot of these genetic diseases um, that have historically not had a lot of, you know, evidence of, of, you know, the inheritance and passing these genetic diseases on. But I think it's important to consider that as, as medicine improves and, and our patients are living longer with these conditions that historically, you know, they were not, um, that we talk about recurrence risks for them so that they are aware of all of their options um, and in family planning and things like that. So this is what I'm really excited to talk about is, is the ethical considerations. And this is how I wanna introduce it to all of you. Um, there is this case study. This is a 12 year old boy who presented to the, I can't remember the institution, but this 12 year old boy presented with Tetralogy of Fallot and Pulmonary Atresia. He was being considered for heart and lung transplant. And as part of the workup, um, the institution he was be being treated at um, actually did a whole genome. And that whole genome identified 22Q deletion. Um, and his particular deletion uh, had an increased risk or was reported to have an increased risk to develop schizophrenia. And because of this, his institution uh, decided no, to no longer list him for transplant. Um, and this case study actually had a quote from the parents that um, they had shared that had they known that, that this testing would have removed options for care for their son, they would not have chosen to gone through with the genetic testing at the time. Um, and I think that this case study, this case study definitely made a really big impact for me because that is never something that I've ever considered or included in my pre-test counseling discussion with patients is, is how do these genetic test results impact your care in a way that could potentially justify um, the refusal of care or the removal of care options. Um, and I think that that's a good transition for us to talk about some of these ethical considerations in using genetic testing in the setting of transplant. Um, I mentioned earlier that developmental delay may be a contraindication. And many of the articles I, I found in, in this review of the literature mentioned neurodevelopmental delay as a contraindication. I think what's really important is that we acknowledge that the consistency in which developmental delay is used as a contraindication um, is not standard. It, it's very much institution-based. There are no standard policies regarding how we measure neurodevelopmental delay and how we determine when, when it plays a role in, in whether or not someone can take care of their organ in, in post-transplant care, um, justification of withdrawal of care, which I just touched on, incidental findings um, is something that I think is, is important in the age where we are ordering more exomes and how someone may use something like you know, uh, Huntington's disease predisposition or Lee Fraumini, um, which the Graf et al. et al. article did find that there was an inconsistency in how these uh, transplant institutions used those findings or would, would use, it was a hypothetical scenario, would use those findings as um, contraindications to recommend someone for transplant. Um, and I think that 
the solution to all of this, and maybe there's no good solution, but I definitely think a step in the right direction is having appropriate genetic support um, in transplant programs and, and involving genetic counselors, medical geneticists in that discussion to, to help understand these kind of case-by-case -case bases in which there may be um, there may be other features, extra renal, extra hepatic, you know, features that um, would potentially play a role in whether or not someone is a good candidate for transplant. So what I found was that many of the guidelines are inconsistent regarding transplant eligibility. And I also noticed that there is a very, there's a lack of transparency about those policies. Um, this was a project that I had started um, when I was rotating as a student at Radies. And part of that project, I looked at different transplant, pediatric transplant um, institutions across the country um, and wanted to see if how, how transparent they were about their policies, about who is eligible for transplant and, and those kinds of things. And it's really difficult to find those policies available to our patients and our families. Um, and also there was an inconsistency in how much an institution was willing to disclose. Uh, there was an article published by um, Wall and colleagues that actually surveyed a lot of pediatric programs and they found, they, surf, they surveyed pediatric and adult programs and they found inconsistencies across both of those programs as far as what they would list as contraindications to transplant. They found that um, pediatric programs were more likely to consider intellectual disability as irrelevant to transplant when compared to the adult programs. Um, but only 24% of those programs that they surveyed um, they still, they still considered severe intellectual disability um, as a possible contraindication. And what does severe intellectual disability mean? Um, that was not something that I believe was assessed by that survey, but that is definitely something to consider. Um, this article also went on to you know, strongly advise um, that programs categorize patient, patients by genetic disease or intellectual disability as part of transplant evaluation. Um, Several studies demonstrated that the post-transplant outcomes between individuals who do not have neurodevelopmental delay or intellectual disability were comparable um, with patients who did have neurodevelopmental delay. And I think that really emphasizes that we should be doing away with the consideration of intellectual disability as a contraindication. Um, many of these articles talk about the use of, of neurodevelopmental delay for transplant consideration as being non-compliant with the American Disabilities Act. Um, traditionally, this was something that was considered because it was a way to determine whether or not a person could um, take good care of their organ after transplant. Um, but a lot of these assessments didn't also put into consideration that person's support system, caregivers, financial support, all of these other factors that we know, you know, um, definitely play into how well a person is able to adhere to or comply to their post-transplant care. Um, in 2016, 30 members of Congress actually wrote a letter to um, the Office for Civil Rights to issue guidance clarifying that, um, number one, organ transplant discrimination violates Title II of the ADA uh, or the American with Disabilities Act. Um, it also wrote a letter describing um, transplant entities must incorporate the patient's support network and services into eligibility policies and practices. And third, that people with disabilities should be provided with all necessary auxiliary aids and services that they need for a successful organ transplant and post-operative regimen. Um, and this was something that I, I knew very little about going into, but I did learn that nine states actually have laws that prohibit organ transplant discrimination. Um, according to the National Council of Disabilities. California is one of those states and California actually has the oldest of those laws dating all the way back to 1996. Um, under California's law, eligibility for transplant cannot be determined on the basis of a person's disability, um, which as we know, some genetic diseases are definitely fall into that category. Um, they do say that except in instances where the disability is medically significant, and this is the phrasing that the state of California uses, medically significant to the success of the transplant. Laws in other states very, are very similar. A lot of them um, used California's law as kind of a jumping off point. Um, 
And the, the National Council of Disabilities includes a lot more details in their 2019 report titled Organ Transplants and Discrimination Against People with Disabilities as part of a five-part series on disability and bioethics, um, something that I found very educational and definitely high, would recommend um, to anyone interested in learning more about this topic. Um, and then lastly, the American Academy of Policy, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics issued a policy statement in 2020 um, that recommended that patients should not be excluded from consideration for solid organ transplant based on intellectual disability or developmental disability. Um, and that the transplant, when likely to provide significant health benefits, that denying that transplant to people with disabilities on the basis of their supposed lower quality of life may constitute illegal and unjustified discrimination. Um, the policy then goes on to advocate for a standardization and definition and assessment of intellectual disability in these eligible patients, um, as well as uh, transplant evaluation being more of a collaborative process between all, you know, relevant stakeholders. So this is a summary of, of I think, everything that we talked about today. Um, I think that we, I hope that we demonstrated well that genetic evaluation as part of the transplant evaluation process um, has a lot of utility for both the donor and transplant recipient side. Um, currently, there are no standardized policies regarding genetic evaluation um, or familial risk assessment prior to transplant eligibility, something that we hope will change. Um, criteria for transplant eligibility is varied across programs and may be potentially discriminatory to individuals with genetic diseases or disabilities. Um, and that all of this I feel highlights the importance of the involvement of genetic counselors and other genetic professionals to aid in the safe and effective application of genetic information in transplant decision-making. So all of our references are um, hosted on a Google Doc that I, I did a QR code because there were a lot of them and I thought it looked cleaner, but um, our references are available there if you're interested in any of the articles that we talked about today. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for your time. And I guess we will take time for questions now. All right. Um, thank you so much, Latrice, for this great presentation. I think this is such an important topic, especially as genetics is moving in, you know, to so many different aspects of healthcare. So, um, for everyone listening to the webinar, um, please remember to submit any questions you may have through the Zoom chat box. And I do see that we have a few in here, so I'm just going to start with those. So, our first one is um, basically asking. So. Is there any guidance on whether or not to report post-transplant identification of hereditary conditions to recipients? Um, our submitter recently had a Lee family ask about this as their son had been an organ donor after he passed away from a car accident, but before they knew about his risk for Lee um, And they are in contact with the recipients of his heart. I can take that one. Um... So there is, there is a OPTN policy that any, I think the word they use is transmissible disease that's identified post donation does need to be reported. Um, that tends to more refer to infectious disease and malignancies, but I think, and I, I don't believe the policy specifically states genetic disease, um, but I do think that most transplant centers would probably, one, appreciate that information. And I think, I, but I don't know if families, how that's communicated to families, if it is a later um, genetic diagnosis. But I would, I would presume for the, for the most part that yes, that is something that is reported and then relayed to the risk, um, probably would be relayed to the transplant center who did the transplant to then disclose to the recipient. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, our next question is asking um, that they have heard about individuals being denied for transplant if they may not be ambulatory. Um, and then wondering if being ambulatory or not would affect health of the new organ. Um, they are wondering if this would be lumped in to the um, intellectual disability developmental delay category. I can, I can answer that one. Um, I'm not, I, I, I'm not a, I did not come across any literature that discussed ambulation as, as part of a contraindication, but I think that 
um, being non-ambulatory as, as a disability um, and, and that being used as justification to deny transplant definitely falls under kind of the discussions that the National Council of Disabilities had, had brought up. Um, their, their report, specifically the report for solid organ transplant was really extensive and I, I highly recommend it. I can't recall anything specific about what they said. Um, and I know that, you know, if you live in one of the other 41 states that doesn't have a law that explicitly um, protects individuals with disabilities against discrimination because of their disability, um, I think that it's fair game for an institution to use their individual policies as, as they see fit, I, so I would assume. I don't know, Dr. Hildreth, do you have anything to add? No, yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, it's, you know, with anything with ambulation, I would not necessarily look at it as a hard criteria. It's, you know, more looking at everything as a, as the patient as a whole. All right. Um, our next question is, are pharmacogenomic results routinely utilized in the setting of transplant care for patients to assist with dosage of medicines like clopidogrel or tacrolimus? That is a great question. Um, so I use tacrolimus all the time, so I can talk about that. So routinely, no. Um, do I think we may be moving in that direction at some point? I would hope so. So there are, you know, as an example, we do check the um, TP, what's called the TPMT genotype on any of our patients who are going to be on a thiopurine metabolite or like azathioprine or 6 mecaptopurine. So there is some like pre-testing that we'll do for some medications, um, but I do think as, you know, we talk more personalized medicine and having more of an understanding about an individual and how they're going to metabolize the medication, I, I'm hopeful that that is something that in my career starts to become more used. All right, thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Um, and just uh, a question I think um, may be oriented more for Nicole, but how can genetic counselors learn more about the transplant policies at their institution? That's a very good question. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think what I would do is I would definitely reach out to specialists like Dr. Hildreth and um, you know, the, the providers in those specialties that you know are performing transplants or working a lot with patients with transplants because, um, and then reaching out to them to see if, if your organization's, you know, transplant center is able to provide you with those policies. Um, I know with, when I was at Rady's, um, I believe that we just obtained the, the policies just from kind of representatives who worked in the transplant center, who worked with kind of communicating with patients and things like that to review. You can also email um, the appropriate people to request that. That's what I did with a couple of other institutions when I was kind of looking at uh, centers across the country. All right. Um, our next question is uh, just in general, in your experience, do parents or patients decline genetic testing in fear of being denied transplant? Do you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, um, and I'd be interested to see your thought on this too. You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, I have not run into that yet, but I think it's a very valid question. I think, you know, in my role, as a hepatologist and also as someone, you know, with an interest in maybe more of an understanding of genetics than some of my other hepatology colleagues, I think, you know, we need to look at how we're utilizing it. If we are looking to make sure we have a diagnosis, that's one thing, but I think more of it would is, I'm going on a little bit of a tangent, but it's really gonna be important that providers are educated because it is a fear of mine that the more we are doing genetic testing, as we saw in some of these cases, that people may be inappropriately denied. So um, I have not yet seen a refusal, but I uh, would not be surprised if that is something that comes up at some point in my career. And I think in those cases, we need to decide, well, what are we doing? Is it because I want to exome sequence everybody and this family says, no, thank you? So then am I just going to cater to panel testing or making sure I'm ruling out all the things that I know I need to rule out? Um, but I, that, that may be something that we start to encounter more. I have not okay. encountered any families 
I, and I'll be honest, that's not something that's part of my usual pretest counseling. It is, you know, based on these results, your future providers may use this as, as a way to deny you care. Um, I fortunately live in California and practice in California where there are laws put in place to prevent that kind of discrimination. Um, but that's not something that that was a part of my counseling um, ahead of this. I've had, and, and I think that it's thinking about my patients and, and some of the patients that have conditions that were included in some of our summary slides. Um, there's also, you have to balance like the family really wanting an answer and at the time their priority is more of the answer than things that we can never predict down the line because um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just hard to predict a lot of times. Not every patient with Noonan syndrome is going to need a heart transplant, um, but is that something that you incorporate into your counseling? And um, that's definitely something that I've, I've more reflected on and, and have wanted to more incorporate into my discussion with my patients than have experienced personally. All right, thank you. Um, and there's a couple more questions that came through. So I think we do have time um, for uh, these last two ones. So the first one is, um, is any pathogenic mutation related to genetic disease in a donor an automatic exclusion for organ donation, even if that genetic disease doesn't affect all organs? For example, a child with a monogenic seizure disorder dies and the family is interested in donating the child's organs. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, I would say the answer, no. So it's more so it would be a case by case basis. So we need to look and see is what is the genetic diagnosis affecting that organ. So in, you know, in a, oftentimes a, a monogenetic seizure disorder, those genes aren't going to cause any liver disease. So that liver would be fine to be donated to someone. But there are some disorders that, you know, absolutely there's a, a risk of disease in another organ. And so in that case, that would not be, um, that would be considered a contraindication. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, and so a question for the two of you. So at your organization, are you predominantly ordering a panel based on the affected organ or whole exome slash whole genome? I can imagine this could also be a factor if a family is concerned about the results being used to prevent transplant. I'm gonna let Dr. Hildreth answer that one. I'm taking all of them, but yeah. So, um, so for me, and I have to say, obviously there is a bias being in San Diego and being at Radio Children's where we are <laughs> very big proponents of um, genome sequencing. So if I have, for liver, if I have a, sicker patients. So if I have a baby coming in with neonatal cholestasis, or if I have an acute liver failure, I'm getting a whole genome. Um, I, you know, we are still, we will still send panel testing on kids that are less urgent, largely because we have one that's free. Um, but I, I am always going more first line for expansive sequencing, but I can tell you that's not the case everywhere, even in our hospital. I think there are, it's definitely not, it is definitely not routine in a uh, transplant evaluation process yet to do whole exome or whole genome. I do think our heart program is utilizing it um, in most patients. Uh, I can say in liver, we are likely as well. I don't think necessarily our kidney um, folks will be would be doing more expensive testing, um, and it's definitely not going to be the answer at every center. I think more center is more centers are still probably probably doing panel testing, but. It's, you know, as this becomes more widely available, um, we'll, we'll kind of see where the trend goes there. Yeah. I think at my institution, the workflow is a little bit different. I don't work super closely with, with the, the, the providers that do coordinate transplant. Um, I, I tr historically have worked in kind of pediatric general genetics and so, um, we often get kids with a bunch of things going on. And um, in thinking of back on my patient population, I do think we order testing as appropriate. So not necessarily defaulting to exome, but kind of taking into considerations all of the features. And if we can order a panel um, that we think is comprehensive enough um, for that patient, then we will order a panel. Um, so I wouldn't say that we default more to panel or exome for either situation. And um, 
I think that because of the way our workflow is structured, it's less of a, well, this patient needs a transplant, let's get them testing beforehand. I don't see as many of those patients, yeah. All right. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Nicole and Dr. Hildreth, for answering all those questions and for everyone listening to submitting such great you know, questions for this conversation. So it does look like we're um, out of time. So today, this does conclude today's member webinar. On behalf of the NSGC webinar subcommittee, I wanted to thank you all for attending this webinar. And once again, a huge thank you to our speakers for sharing their stories and experiences. This webinar recording will be posted to the webinar page of the NSGC website within 48 hours. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye.